science, the supernatural, biblical prophecy, global events that threaten to rattle the very foundation of human existence, critical examination of the most important issues facing today's modern world. Welcome to the Sharpening Report. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd, I'd like to welcome you to the Sharpening Report. This is James DeWitt, and with me today I have a very, very special guest I'm honored to, to have, uh, Kenneth Johnson, and uh, he has a, a very special book uh, out uh, called Agad the Seer, and uh, if you haven't heard about it, you need to, because it's actually mentioned in the Bible in the Old Testament. Welcome Ken, it is such an honor to have you here. I'm, I'm excited, and, uh, and this is some great news. It's almost like uh, it's, it's almost like Father God is just like, you know, giving gifts out uh, <laughs> in, in in our day and age. First, uh, the the ancient uh, uh, text of, of Enoch and others in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which you uh, presented, uh, you published, and um, also now Gad the Seer. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Where to start? <laughs> well, um, there's a lot of books mentioned in the Old Testament. Um, and, well, I guess basically we should start by saying that we need to understand that the 66 books in our Bible are inspired, and we're not supposed to add anything to the canon. And so Absolutely. we don't want to do that. But by the same token, when those 66 books that are inspired, written by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit happens to mention, by the way, if you want more information on this, look at this book. That's really high recommendation. Absolutely. So these things weren't put in Scripture, so you don't know that they haven't been tampered with, or the translation's a little funny, or something like that. So they always need to be looked at as secondary sources. But like the book of Jasher gives you almost three times the amount of information in the area of Genesis. So when you read Genesis and you look at it and you think, who is that guy? What's the situation? Be a lot of information in there. And so some of these things will go on. The Book of Enoch contains some ancient history. It contains prophecy relevant to our lifetime. And so there's a lot of those things. And then recently, um, you know, in, in 1 Chronicles 29:29, it talks about David it, when David died. And it said, if you want to know more about his life, the things that happened in the kingdoms, things like that, Look in the books of Samuel. We have that in the scripture, First and Second Samuel, and in the the books of Nathan and Gad, who were seers or prophets. So they definitely wrote books of prophecy and history, and they weren't included in the canon because they're not supposed to be, but they're recommended reading. Absolutely, I, I tell uh, people, you know, once upon a time there was a, a day and age where I was afraid to look at some of these things, and and with good reason. I think at that time I didn't have good sense to be able to discern which were the good ones and which were the bad ones. Uh, I hate to even lump them together, but when you don't know any different, they're all sort of the same to you. But right. some, if, if like you say, if if Scripture actually recommends, uh, it just dawned on me. Uh, we read Christian publications all the time, uh, Christian magazines, things telling us about Scripture, about everything under the sun. Uh, why not? I mean, uh, wouldn't it be better to read one that's actually recommended by the Bible itself? As you yeah, say. exactly. Now, just because that's the case, though, we've got cults, Gnostics and stuff from the first century that would create a fake Jasher, a fake Gad. So just because you yeah. find something doesn't mean it's not tampered with or it's not a fake one. Um, I've probably looked at probably close to 100 scrolls, and out of that I've published six, and the rest of them I consider junk. You know, Absolutely. and I, I, did, I did one book called The, the uh, Demonic Gospels, where I looked at all the Gnostic Gospels and showed you the basic plan of salvation, so you can see that they're totally anti-scriptural, and you yeah. get the idea that these things are not something we want to mess with. Yeah, I have that too, and uh, that's that's very very uh, needful for people who are interested in exploring uh, or just just opening up uh, a little a little bit more. In, in my case, I I see it more as a uh, like say with the uh, events of Genesis. It's kind of like just putting a magnifying glass on certain things, bringing out the detail. Um, and mm -hmm. it's, it's from a trusted source. Although um, when <laughs> I encountered. Uh, Second Enoch, or, or the the secrets of Enoch, and this sort of thing. 
I'm like, this doesn't even uh, jibe with me. Uh, it doesn't doesn't even. Uh, it just didn't come together. And uh, I think that was the Lord letting me know that it wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, it recommended. <laughs> Right. To say the least. Yeah, one, one of the things that I've done is I went back to the early church fathers, uh, specifically the disciples of the apostles. And so they've made comments like uh, there's the book of Enoch, which is legitimate. And then there's yes. two, three, four, five, you know, books. And those were all fake. A lot of times they'll tell you which Gnostic cult wrote it and why it's messed up and this kind of stuff. So it's really nice to have a church father that was taught by somebody who knew a disciple that says this is the the books we want to use but we also mention Enoch or we mention this or that and to use them as guidance yeah just so you know I cite you as a very good source for these uh, materials and when people are looking at them first first of all uh, you know you're not uh, someone who's wanting Jubilees and Enoch and some of the other things um, they're going to different sources and you know what I hate unfortunately sometimes is that they'll include a preface or something else extra in there that really doesn't even it might not even have a, a how can I say a, a, a biblical point of view uh, the person who translated it uh, to my amazement sometimes and and I almost wanted to, to tell the person that I gave the book to because I didn't have anything else to lend like a version of uh, the book of Enoch that had a really anti it almost had like an anti-biblical preface to it and I'm and I'm telling the person well just ignore the first few pages from the author and read the actual material I just but with you I don't have to worry about that I <laughs> I learn a lot from uh, just uh, all your work and to have them all together really makes a smoother uh, exploration through all these things so I that's why I direct people to you because you've covered uh, some so many of these things and I'm really appreciative uh, and you did this in under I gotta be honest you just said you've been at this Less than a decade? Uh, just a little over a decade, little about over. ten and a half years. Looking at the at the uh, just the amount of materials you have out at this point, I, I without digging and researching, I presumed you you must have been at it at least twice that amount. I mean, like almost twenty years. I, that's like to me, that's like twenty years worth of work at least. Well, I've been researching and, and teaching on the church fathers and things like that for a long time. But I just started writing, actually, finally in 2006. Wow. Well, I guess I'm right on time. Uh, do you, do you, what's your main website that you'd like to direct people to so I can put this up right away? Uh, Biblefacts.org. Okay. Um, and uh, is, is that also where if uh, someone has, uh, I don't know if you answer questions, but people are going to try to get at you anyway is that where you would like to direct the questions or anything like that towards that that website okay yeah that would be fine yeah there's a sec there should be a link on there to send me an email so um, before I there's a lot of things I'd like to ask you about like I was saying earlier so before we go any further what 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 do you have to tell us about the book of Gad oh, okay um, basically we know from scripture that Gad was a prophet. Gad and Nathan were two major prophets in the time of David that, that helped David a lot. Uh, this book of Gad, it's, it's got an interesting history. Uh, according to the history, there were, uh, at the time when Israel and Judah separated and the ten tribes went to the north and then they apostatized, and then the Lord sent the Assyrians in to take the ten tribes captive. Uh, the, the Assyrians had come in and taken two of the tribes and it came back in to take more and this was obviously going to happen and there were believers in both kingdoms and apostates in both kingdoms but the northern tribes were mainly apostate yeah. and so there was a group of 460 uh, Israelites that decided that we don't want to go into captivity and we want to worship the Lord so they picked up and went all the way south as far as they could to Yemen and so they avoided the captivity they stayed down there for several centuries until after the Muslim groups rose up and started persecuting Jews in Lemon, in Yemen rather. Uh, so then they picked up and they, they went to uh, India and they've been at the southern tip of India ever since. And there's a group of Jews in, in the port city of Cochin or Kochi, India and uh, they have, since they went, since it was that early, 
they have the Old Testament, like most Jews have as their Bible, but they don't even have a, or at that time at least, didn't even have a, a complete New or Old Testament like we do. Mm. But they had most of it. But they had what was called the Missing Five. And if you go back through Kings and Chronicles, it'll talk about, in addition to Samuel and his time period, there was uh, the, the prophet Gad, uh, Nathan, Ahijah, Shemaiah, and Iddo. And they all wrote books, history and or prophecy or whatever. Yeah. And so the scriptures <laughs> tell us that. Well, they supposedly have all those books in their canon. And then in the 1600s, there was a Jew that of that area that became a Christian and decided to translate the book of Gad. So the first edition from their Hebrew uh, of Gad was written into Dutch. Then about a century later, a translation was made in German. And uh, then about a century later, uh, supposedly, according to legend anyway, a uh, copy of it came out of the Vatican archives. Well, all this is suspicious because you've got what may or may not be real translated into Dutch and then into German and then something from the Vatican archives, which may or may not have been there. So a lot of people treated it as suspicious and just kind of left it set. Uh, then, though, there were fragments found in Israel, and all these fragments and copies uh, tend to agree one to the other. Now, the large copy that is the whole book is in a uh, university in England. I think it's Cambridge. And it's been studied by uh, several universities. The Barlin University in Tel Aviv, or right side out of Tel Aviv, has uh, been trying to push this and get scholars to look at it for quite a while. But it's just one of those things. In the 1700s, when New Scrolls <laughs> came out, people uh, like Bishop Lightfoot and several of the, the older people, because of scripture, wanted to translate them and make them known. Shortly thereafter, though, you've got the majority of higher critics that say, well, it doesn't really matter anyway, we don't care, it's all fiction. And so the, a lot of these scrolls are sitting around somewhere, but nobody really cares to translate them. And I'm just amazed because uh, when I did a translation of Enoch, there were several, not several, but a few places in there that were obviously Gnostic inserts. So there's always problems with stuff. Yeah. In this book, uh, there really isn't anything that's anti-biblical in it. That's fantastic, man. Uh, and um, so, is it okay to ask uh, what this tribe or this uh, certain group of Jewish people, uh, is there a particular name that they go by? or um, Just the, identify. I guess, the city. Yeah, Cochin, India. Well, that so. is fantastic. Um, I, I just noticed the pattern. Now, uh, concerning uh, the to go back to the book of Enoch a, a lot of people immediately say the word sort of dogmatically the book of Enoch is not inspired and and I'm a little hesitant to go there in a sense because I think people diverge on that meaning of that term right uh, because scripture itself says that Enoch spoke prophecy mm -hmm. um, how can you speak prophecy unless it's inspired of God uh, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that the book of Enoch is missing from the Bible. I agree with you totally. The book of Enoch was meant to be, it, it, to, to sort of sit away in the dark a little while mm -hmm. and to come out in the Dead Sea Scrolls for a purpose. And if, for example, if you read the very first, uh, the very first uh, paragraph, it says that it, it was for a future generation, one which was to come, not for Enoch himself or his generation. Mm -hmm. And that sort of just made my hair stand up on end. So, mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I don't hold it up to the Bible. Uh, the Bible is the anvil that's worn out many hammers. But, uh, but I just, uh, well, I never forget what it said about the work of Jesus uh, on earth. It said that if everything he had done had been written, uh, I think it was John, maybe, who said that mm -hmm. even the books, even the, the very earth couldn't hold the number of books. Right. Just talking about what Jesus did. So just imagine, um, I, I just know that there is so much out there that has been recorded of the Lord that we, we don't even know about. And that's 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 all I see it as. And, and I think the Lord just, sometimes he gathers, gathers something up and presents it to us just to show his sovereignty, to show who he is, and and 
it, this is meant to happen in our time. I think uh, he's. It's the book of Daniel too. Uh, um, knowledge being increased. Uh, knowledge of the right. Lord. So and, yeah. and I, sure, go ahead. Uh, the church fathers said the same thing. Uh, Irenaeus, when he quoted that passage in Daniel about uh, the knowledge shall increase, he said specifically that it was when the Jews would come back in the land from that time forward, the prophecies would begin to be fulfilled and it would be fairly obvious to all who study. Yeah. And so we, we see that all over. And to the idea of the, the inspiration, uh, there's a couple of different meanings to it. Um, someone could give or the Lord could give someone today a word of wisdom a word of knowledge and even if you think the gifts are done away with in the first century we have in the book of Acts prophets and people that had words of wisdom and words of knowledge and so that's the same thing as a prophecy and so what they said may or may not have been put in the canon so we have to understand that when we say the 66 books of the Bible are inspired and only the 66 books we're talking about the Holy Spirit dictating that he wants certain books and only certain books in the canon and that's what we need to understand uh, prophecy and righteousness and salvation and then there could be a prophecy a word of wisdom or knowledge from someone any along along the time frame uh, pre-flood post-flood church history now and so in a sense they're inspired because they're God given if it's a word of wisdom but it's not inspired in the sense of being added to the canon. So, yeah, it's Absolutely. two separate concepts. And then there's two that that one, I think uh, the one uh, book of Scripture that is not in the 66, uh, that's that's very important, I think Jesus would, would say, is is you and I. We are that, that one unwritten, uh, un, that, well, the one that's continually being written. Uh, the you know each uh, you have the four main gospels these four gentlemen telling you their experience with Jesus and looking at them together you can you can get a bigger picture of uh, you know if you ever heard the analogy of the the blind men and the elephant you know two mm -hmm. people describing the same thing but listening listening to them together you get a bigger description and and so like what's the gospel according to you, Ken Johnson, or or you, or you, uh, you know, uh, or me, um, and and that's, it. you know, it says uh, that we overcome uh, with the uh, blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So, uh, in, in Jesus' eyes, I think we are a very valuable, special. Uh, I know some people are like, oh, come on, but it's true. Uh, um, we are like to him. Uh, we're like, if you're born again, you're the living word. Uh, he said that. That uh, if he is in us, then our, his word will be in us, just as he is in his father, and and he doesn't say anything unless his father gave it to him to speak. So, mm -hmm. so I didn't mean to digress, but I really, I just really feel that that all uh, works together. Yes, and, it does. Uh, I'm really privileged to, uh, and, and you, you, you have to be excited to be a part of this. Uh, oh, definitely. Absolutely, I say the Lord's uh, hand is on you, man, and uh, you know I'm I'm privileged in some way, just uh, in some small way, if I can be a part of this too and doing this with you. So, it well, really just is a getting the word out that these things exist and and helping yeah. understand more prophecy, it's uh, very important. And and a lot of people too like to knock the ancient text because they say, well, you know. Uh, I don't want to make the Bible any less important. Let me tell you, the enthusiasm I get after reading some of these things makes me go back and look at the Word with fresh eyes. Um, oh, yeah. it, it brings up elements, certain things that I'm like, let me look for that. I never thought of looking for that. And lo and behold, there these things are in Scripture all along that this other book brought to my attention. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know it's of the Lord. Uh, he, I think He has to work with us individually, uh, each and every one of us on that, but that's what the living word does I mean uh, mm. we just put it out there or he puts it out there and uh, God himself does the rest uh, as far as uh, working on people's hearts and, and their minds especially those who uh, who don't really know the Lord so I, I, I really hope that uh, that all of these things um, some some people would will read the book of Enoch but not touch the Bible um, just that's because true too yeah it just uh, some of the things they've heard and they're into giants and stuff like that I think the Lord he knows what he's doing 
He really, mm-hmm. and I trust him. Um, so uh, I'm sorry, I didn't. I hope I didn't stop what what you were sharing about Ged. Uh, oh, not at all. I just talked about the history of it for the first part. Yeah. How many chapters are there in there? Uh, there there's uh, 14 chapters, and the first, second, and 14th have to deal with prophecy. And there's a lot of detail in the others. There's uh, two chapters that have uh, sermons of David, and uh, they're amazing mm. as far as the theology that it teaches. And uh, you can really see how David was a man after God's own heart. Yeah. There's uh, two chapters that teach on the law of Moses and the Noahite laws and why Gentiles are supposed to keep part of the law or not part of the law, and there's a big discussion on that, which is kind of important for our time period. And uh, the the prophecies, though, in them are amazing. Absolutely. Uh, For for instance, uh, chapter 14 is a good example. Um, Moses commanded that they do the festivals, the seven festivals. Uh, You can see that back in Leviticus. But uh, the festivals, for instance, like the High Holy Days, you've got um, the uh, first and the second of Tishrei, which is which is uh, the day of it of Excuse me. First and second Tishrei is um, trumpets. And so that festival teaches on the resurrection. And Paul says the resurrection happens with the rapture. And then you've got uh, the, the Day of Atonement, which is the 10th. And that teaches on the death of the Antichrist, establishment of the millennial reign. And in between the two, you've got seven days that are known as the, the terrible days, the Yamin Noraim. And it's a figure of the seven-year tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. And so you can see this in outline. When you get to Gad in chapter 14, he sees a vision, and it's pretty interesting because it's Judgment Day, which would mean Tishrei 1 and 2, and the books are open and brought before the Lord, and the first set of books is those that were guilty but have made righteous by the Lamb. And we don't know how or what, but that's just what it is. So those are given eternal life today. And then they bring the second set of books, and those are ones that have not made a decision. And so he says, I'm not going to judge them now. I'm going to set that aside until one-third the way through the month to see what they will do. Well, we know that's Yom Kippur, and we know what the festivals teach. And then after that, they bring the last set of books, which is the Book of the Dam, they're handed over to Satan to be destroyed, and then the, the millennial reign, basically, or the kingdom is established. And so it's a really interesting passage, and there's a lot more in there, but it clearly teaches a rapture then in a second, a seven-year period. And if you didn't understand anything about uh, the Messiah, you have until that time to make a decision. So it very clearly teaches uh, a tribulational period, a second coming, and these type of things and it's amazing to think that this would have been a vision that was given a prophet at 1000 BC in the time of David so that's 3000 years ago and then the end time prophecies of chapter 1 and 2 just are very amazing absolutely and it's it sounds like it really uh, explores some things that early on in my uh, I've been reading the Bible since I was a kid but I just sort of got the impression that we didn't understand certain imagery and some symbology until the book of Revelation was given but uh, I had no idea I when I looked at the, say the book of Enoch and it's like wow it reads so much the same the imagery and everything and here again some of the, these elements uh, it sounds uh, like the same sort of deal here in certain respects mm-hmm yeah, the language of the Hebrew of uh, Gad the seer is really interesting because it's an older type of Hebrew. Um, and and it, it's interesting just to see how it describes things. For instance, it talks about the New Jerusalem, one of David's sermons. But it doesn't say New Jerusalem per se. It's the future Jerusalem, which is now concealed. So he would say the concealed wow. Jerusalem. But you know what we're talking about. You know, veiled, and they're just a whole, she's described as veiled like a, a bride is adorned. Mm-hmm. Right. So can see all. So there's a lot of the the exact same information is given, but it's descriptive in a different way, and it's yeah. just got that air of authenticity to it. Yeah, yeah. I, boy, I'm almost uh, I'm almost chomping at the bits here just to 
to to read it. Uh, so uh, uh, that's uh, when when did it uh, when did you finish on this work and and actually how long was the process to uh, to do this or I know you had to search well, a lot of text there. Well, the first and second chapter has been floating around out there in a lot of places because there's several scholars that are trying to get people to pay attention to it. And uh, when you just read the first chapter and part of the second chapter, it's really confusing. You need the rest of it uh, to figure out what the symbols mean and everything. And so uh, about a month and a half ago, no, about three months ago, uh, I was given the, the, the Hebrew text. And I was surprised that the whole thing, you know, was there. And so I wow. put everything aside and wanted to get this translated and figure out the prophecies, put the commentary with it, and get the book out. So it's a little over a three-month period. Well, I'm so glad you decided to, to expedite this thing and <laughs> so I can get my hands on a copy really soon. Um, I, wow, that's just uh, really exciting. So you, um, you, uh, do you... You, you sell directly from the website itself uh, all of your titles or I just want to make sure to yeah from my website's biblefacts.org and there's a bookstore there but they're actually links to Amazon mm -hmm. uh, so that way I don't have to stop and, and sell and package and ship and everything they take care of all that for me so uh, it's, it's really nice that way but I've got 25 I believe or so books and two DVDs and I'm working on uh, some more, so uh, just to try to get some of this stuff out. A lot of stuff on prophecy, a lot of stuff on uh, translations of scrolls. Yeah. Uh, on the prophecy side, it's interesting because people usually look at Israel coming back as a nation as a fulfillment of prophecy, and a lot of people think, okay, well, there's one, you know, recently, and they don't realize there's actually been over 50 biblical prophecies fulfilled in the last 70 years. And when you see that kind of thing, it's just amazing. That can't be a coincidence. Absolutely so you see the not. Bible being very specific. Yeah, yeah. And, and you say the last seven years. Uh, I'm thinking... Of uh, seven. Yeah, that's... I'm, Since Israel's been around, yeah. Wow, that's actually... A, I got to uh, let that sink in a bit myself, because I'm actually thinking the past 20 years. Um, that This is really accelerated. Things are really, hmm. really, really... Uh, cranking up uh, and uh, not meaning to, to, to cross over but you know we're uh, at a time where uh, there's an election going on and that's all people are talking about and everything so uh, um, just on, in every field um, again with like things like science and things like that you have all these different fields of science where everybody is uh, converging things are speeding up um, and it's all across the board um, mm -hmm. and, and this is completely e if you pay attention, uh, there's really only two ways to look at it. E either it's going to make you uh, feel sort of good or bad. What I mean is, is uh, we see it as a good thing or a bad thing because uh, I think you and I, as Christians, we we see it as a the hastening of the coming of the Lord, um, mm -hmm. and we take comfort in that. I think everybody else is a little bit more concerned about just uh, everything going kaboom. Which yeah. is that's that's a very valid concern, but uh, well, there could always be terrorist attacks and things like that. But we know yeah. the world's not going to end for at least a thousand and seven years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it, you were you were touching on a certain period uh, and and talking about uh, the the uh, prophecy of or the things concerning uh, Ged uh, during that period of time. Uh, of the millennial reign, uh, the millennial reign of Christ, um, a, a lot of people uh, are surprised at the concept that children will be born during this time. There will be families, uh, uh, marriages, uh, things like this. People living, but according to Scripture, as I understand it, uh, during this time, if someone uh, dies at like a hundred years old, people will say, "Well, what was wrong that he died so young?" Mm -hmm. um, where do you see, if I can ask? I know this is a little bit, a little bit of a rabbit trail, but uh, those of us who were previous to then, who are believers, uh, where do you, where do you see us fitting in? Uh, I, I don't see us just sort of uh, leaning somewhere uh, up against a wall and not doing anything. I, I, I don't know. Where, do you have any ideas on on that sort of thing? 
uh, what we'll be doing. Yeah, basically, um, if you are a believer in Messiah, uh, by the time the, the kingdom comes, we will have our glorified bodies. We'll be back on earth, uh, much like what Christ was uh, after his resurrection. Uh, a lot of people that follow the beast, take the mark, will be destroyed. Uh, some people will not be Christians, not be believers after the rapture. And during the millennial, or the tribulation period, rather, people will get saved. And those people will make it, some of them at least, will make it through into the kingdom. And so you'll have mortals and immortals both living together in the millennial reign. Mortals, of course, will be having children. Uh, but the lifespans will be put back the way they used to be. And we can see pre-flood world people living close to a thousand years, 700 to 900 years. And then right after the flood, the average lifespan was 400 for a few generations, and it got cut in half again yeah. to 200, and now we're around 100. So a lot of people speculate that the probably the canopy will be put back, that the atmosphere will be fixed, lifespans will go back close to that, to what they used to be. And it's just going to be an awesome time, I think. And, of course, then at the end of the millennial reign, we're going to have uh, the Battle of Gog and Magog. So uh, Satan's always got his hand in there somewhere. It's it's very good to hear your view on that. I am completely uh, – we're, we're on the same page, including the whole canopy. I, um, it just makes logical sense and, and biblical sense um, and scientific sense. Uh, but it's it's funny how – you know, certain people can disagree on the the most. Well, I, I heard a lot of people who don't agree with that, and I was just a bit surprised. But uh, without going, yeah, I've never know. I've never been a scientist per per se, so I couldn't tell you exactly how it works. Yeah. I know there are canopies in some uh, some of the planets in our solar system still, uh, so it's definitely a possibility. But I've always been on the history side, and Josephus, yeah. Jasher, and there's a few other documents that actually talk about a canopy. So well, I would consider it a historical fact yeah. rather than a scientific one. Yeah, I think Dr. Carl Baugh and uh, some of his colleagues, they, they did wonderful work uh, when I was a young guy uh, looking at some of that, that stuff, uh, if you're familiar, the, the model they presented and everything, um, really put into my mind something that that as I've grown older, it, it works into what I've learned uh, of, of history and scripture, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, mm -hmm. And the cutting down of our lifespan too. I mean, if, while we're on these on this topic, uh, makes sense to me too because we were being used genetically uh, by the Nephilim, and um, well, if you weaken the source material, then that limits what they can do mm -hmm. um you know uh they they were using you, you gotta i hmm, i heard something today where they they talked about uh the the uh what do you call the the cro magdan man or or whatever the ne neanderthal um mm -hmm. uh, how that they had rickets <clears throat> and and everything just despite their large stature and and uh, which, which often goes un, un, unrecognized that they had larger cranial. I know I'm going off into the science a little bit here, but mm. bear with me. Uh, how they were talking about how these are often uh, found with rickets, um, mm -hmm. and and maybe didn't have good health. What what people still don't really realize something that just dawned on me. I think these are simply aged, pre-flood people. People, if you live to be eight, seven or eight hundred years old, as you say, you know, uh, certain certain parts of our features, uh, bone, uh, our brow, nose, keeps growing. Uh, imagine what you look like at eight hundred years. You're, you, mm -hmm. um, I think for eight hundred years, if your knees are a bit bowed and your brow is just a bit large, you're looking pretty good. Um, <clears throat> but the the superior lifespan, extremely dense bones, all this stuff. Uh, this is the this is what the Nephilim were using to create these awful uh, offspring. Um, so with the Lord, um, you notice that it was after the flood that He instituted uh, the law uh, as far as the the, the Torah, um, certain you know marital laws, you know, um, and things like that. So maybe genetically, what was okay 
back, you know, people like to dismiss the old, the idea of uh, Adam and Eve's children uh, having, they're like, well, where did they get their wives from? Well, where do you think they got their wives from? Um, mm -hmm. it, but genetically, uh, it wasn't a danger back then, but uh, right after the flood, things changed, and it, it's all for our protection. Sorry, I didn't mean to be long-winded, but it really does, when you when you look at all the pieces, it does look in the favor of God doing things to to, to protect us, and mm -hmm. uh, we can no longer be utilized to the extent by the enemy uh, or or the Nephilim, which I believe are what people call aliens nowadays, all that stuff, uh, alien abductions and things. They're still genetically tampering with people, things like that, but they can't... Um, they can't quite do with us what they used to, but they still need us. I didn't mean to diverge, but again, it just, uh, it's good to talk to you about these things because uh, I like to, it's good to hear, I think there's a lot of people out there who would like to know where some of your opinions are on some of these things and all your researching that you've done. Yeah, sure. Um, I, like I say, I'm not too good on the scientific part but I like to do the historical so yeah. people will come and ask me what I think about Nephilim for instance it's like well I don't really have opinion scientifically but I can show you a lot of scrolls that talk about them about their civil wars the things that they did how they did some of their experiments some of those things are written down and so you can bring all those scrolls together and maybe it's true and maybe it's not you know people argue that but those records exist and so that's some of the things that I like to do is just bring out some of these and uh, your your idea of the, the marriage, I think, is is uh, exactly right. Is when we look at the Bible, we have uh, forbidden sexual relationships with brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles, and it goes out so far. And if you look at just the the laws here in the United States, it goes out even further. So what was okay back then is somewhat messed up now. So you can see the genes weakening over time. So if the Lord was to tarry another 500 or 1,000 years, uh, you probably wouldn't be able to uh, have children with like your 6th, 7th, or 8th cousins. I mean, it would just keep getting worse and worse. So it's a, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, it all comes together. And, and as far as science go, it, we're talking science. I, I'll just say if it doesn't, if it doesn't uh, jive with the Bible, it's not actually science. I, I don't... Uh, measure a lot of people say oh you know science proves proves the bible no i actually am reversed on that i think the mm -hmm. bible proves what is actual science or not so mm -hmm. uh it's good to uh, it's good to know uh that you and i agree on these things so i i kind of got that anyway uh in some of a lot of your lectures and things like that and please i hope you keep on doing that you know i enjoy those those lectures and and uh teachings uh a lot uh what's your latest uh dvd set uh before the uh i don't know are you going to do one on gad or do you have uh i'm planning on it yeah, yeah. the last one i did was um i i'm planning on doing a, a four or five series on prophecy and i've got the first two done uh the the outline of the prophecy and then the church age uh that mainly hinges on like daniel 11 which gives us a clear pattern from 536 BC up to 1948 AD in prophecy and uh, the whole idea that there are certain dates that are set I mean the scripture gives us uh, 32 AD is the date of the Messiah's death predictably and it gives us uh, a prophecy that says Israel's second return should be in 1948 and the taking back of the Temple Mount should be in 1967 on our calendar and those came to pass to the day like all the other prophecies just like the Exodus and the others. And then building on the few dates that we can set that are actually all in history now, uh, going on with all the other prophecies. Uh, Israel was supposed to come back on a certain date to the land that they were supposed to come back. They were supposed to name their country Israel instead of Judah, uh, be reborn under a guy named after King David, David Ben-Gurion, mm. supposed to bring back the Hebrew language, you know, and it just keeps going on and on, all these prophecies. And so it's, it's kind of important to see the Bible prophecies all the way through history up until, yeah, my dad was alive at that time. And so you get the idea that, yeah, this is really real. It's not just Sunday school real. And just to get people to understand this stuff is controlled. God's in control. And he said what he said. 
And the whole reason we have prophecy is so that you know God's in control. And the Bible's the only book that actually is accurate that does that. Right. And that same book tells us you're going to hell because of the situation you're born into, but there is a way out of it. And all you have to do is trust Messiah. And that may seem too simple, but this is the same book that's telling you what's going to happen in the next few days. So it's a very, very important uh, witnessing tool that we should use. Yeah. I, I maintain uh, if it gets too complicated relating to salvation, that's probably deviating away from God's plan because, remember, it has to be easy enough for a child to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Jesus reinforced that. So, uh, you know, as I get older, the more I learn, the less I see I know. The, the the simpler I see God really made things. Uh, it's it's we're the ones who overcomplicate things, um, yes. <laughs> throwing in our own notions and things like that. Even with reading scripture, we all tend to try to say, well, this is what the Lord is trying to say. If we're talking about the Lord. He gave us these these books uh, to help our understanding, not to confuse us. We got to keep that right. in mind. So it, unless the Lord's says here's the interpretation or something like that I, I, I'm, I'm taking things literally now um, unless he says otherwise um, and that does the job for me I really see um, I don't know I've seen some miraculous things in, in my life uh, since I've started just seeing scripture that way and, uh, and it really makes a difference um, well, I think it does. I mean, if you start thinking everything is symbolic of something else, that's how we get into the replacement theology and all the other stuff, which is uh, prophesied that it's an error, and we see that all over. Even Gad gives us uh, information on that. And so you need to take everything as being literal. People laugh at you, and it's like we understand that a seven-headed red dragon in the book of Revelation is not literal. But you have to understand this is a vision or a dream. So John was literally in the spirit on the Lord's day on the island of Patmos and he had a dream or a vision. And this is literally what the dream was. And so it is all literal in a sense, but when there's a parable or a dream or a vision, that would be symbolic. And you, you have to understand that outside of dreams and visions, everything is exactly perfectly literal. Right. Keeping in mind too, it just dawned on me one day uh, when I was a young guy in the Lord, I. I just got excited and I just looked up and said, Lord, I know something you can't do. You can't lie. Because um, whatever he says, it is. So mm -hmm. that keeps it pretty simple. Yeah. So uh, was there, uh, was there uh, anything else that was in the for forefront of uh, what you're working with right now that, that uh, you'd like people to know about or anything that's just on your mind before we close out today? Uh, well, it's pretty interesting uh, with this. I, I've done uh, books on prophecy, showing what the church fathers taught, which basically is the same thing that we always do. And last summer, I uh, put together the end times by the church fathers and just went a little bit further. What, what did they teach about the, the ten nations, the end times, the Antichrist? And there was a few extra prophecies in it that uh, couldn't pinpoint exactly where they came from. And so then the Lord began to drop some of these scrolls in my lap this year, uh, which is really interesting. And Gad has um, several things in it that identifies uh, the Islamic nations and another power which Revelation would call the uh, harlot church and begins to identify where some of these are and how they work together and how they come together. It's just an amazing set of prophecies. Um, I'm looking at another, uh, another scroll at the moment trying to get it done. And it's pretty interesting. It talks about uh, towards the end times, there's going to be a group of nations that are called the Dragon Nations of Arabia. And it's pretty interesting because if you think about it, the Muslim nations that are Arab uh, are focused on Arabia because that's where Mecca Medina is. And they have this kind of replacement theology and they hate Jews and they try to destroy Jews. And at one point, they actually gather together, go to... Uh, Syria or Syria and try to destroy it and they are aided by two non dragon nations but non Arabic ones which are Persia which is Iran and Turkey and it's interesting the way it talks about so you've got these Arab Muslim nations and these non Arab Muslim nations 
and they come together to do same things in the end times. And it's just interesting to see, uh, and there's a lot of prophecies we could talk about as far as Islam goes, but the pattern that you would, if you just study the scripture and think about it and study it for a long time, you'll probably figure out most of the answers. And it's just interesting to see some of these scrolls just come right out and tell you this is what it is. So it, it's pretty amazing. So I'm, I'm working on some of that stuff and just trying to make people aware of, of Gad the seer, uh, the theology, the prophecy. And we didn't even get into the, the first two chapters, which have some amazing prophecies in them. Uh, but I would encourage uh, people to, to get it, look at it, uh, see what kind of things that they can think of. And um, Anybody out there that happens to know of or can get a hold of some of these other scrolls like uh, the book of Nathan the prophet you know some of these things we would love to get a hold of those translate those get them out to the public too definitely I'll, I'll make sure that this is uh, that this is known uh, I do plan on doing some uh, promoting like I said and uh, do intend on having you back in the future you mentioned uh, one or two of uh, prophecies at the beginning of Gad, is, is there anything you want to, to hint out of uh, what's in there? or? Uh, well, the, the prophecy says that there are basically going to be these two uh, religious powers that cannot be destroyed by man. It has to be destroyed. They're evil. They try to replace Israel. Uh, it has to be destroyed when the Messiah comes to set up the kingdom. And it's, it's an interesting set of prophecies because he sees this Messiah as a lamb coming and doing something and somehow creating a group called the redeemed and these people were sinners but now somehow are not you know in the prophecies it's pretty interesting uh, but it talks about uh, old Edom and new Edom and it gives you an, a hint uh, a hint of who these people are and how they come against the Israel in the, in the last times and it's it's pretty interesting and part of it is Islamic right. and part of it is is other things but uh, it actually identifies uh, the, the the group that well in Ezekiel it talks about something is a hook in the jaw that pulls Russia down to invade and in Ezekiel 38 I think it's about verse 17 it says talking about Russia aren't you the one that my prophets of old talked about and I used to read that and think not really because this is the first time anybody's ever mentioned Russia you know or mm. God may God yes. uh, but Gad does actually, and he identifies that these uh, these are the two religious powers that come together that actually cause Russia to come down and, and to attack Israel. So in Ezekiel 38 and 39, we see who is attacking Israel and what the outcome is, and in Gad we see the people behind it that are pulling the strings. And I've never been one for conspiracy theories at all, but when the church fathers mention things, and then we find a scroll like this saying the exact same thing, it's it's really interesting. It is as history unfolds, and uh, we follow these threads, some of which I never knew existed. Uh, finding that they trail all the way down from early ancient times to right here, right now. The the first and second chapter. There's a lot of little things in there, but the basic main thing is that um, there is this Islam, which is called Edom, and there's this uh, power behind it that joins with, with it in the last days, and it's called New Edom. And the description of this New Edom is a religious power that exists in Rome, Italy, and it is a Trinitarian group as opposed to Old Edom is not a Trinitarian group. And uh, this power uh, believes in a trinity, it believes it's replaced Israel, and eventually unites with old Edom in an attempt to destroy Israel. And so it's really interesting to see a Roman Catholic slash Muslim connection coming against Israel that actually causes Russia to come down, and then that would be enough to wipe anybody out, so God has to intervene. So it's yeah. interesting to see a 3,000 year old definition of what the harlot church is which is not because I've always went back and forth it's like it sounds Roman Catholic but the Muslims have killed more Jews than anybody else yeah. but it sounds you know and you kind of go back and forth it's interesting to see two of these coming together it's not even really anti-Roman Catholic it's just in the end there's these two groups that kind of come together 
So it's a pretty amazing prophecy. That and the the whole pre-trib rapture, seven-year tribulation thing, and there's a ton of other stuff in there too. Yeah, but, I've um, often wondered uh, how do you reconcile? You know, you've got this whole uh, Muslim mandate to take over the world, um, and you've got the the Vatican uh, with their agenda, and you know, I'm like, uh, okay, at some point, you know, something, you know, as, as prophecy unfolds, how's that going to work out? You yeah. Know? And it's like, I'm like, there's a dozen different ways I think this could go, you know, but mm -hmm. hopefully half of them I hope I'm not here for, at least most of them. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully I'm out of here uh, by the time we get to that part, but maybe not. I, I'm still a little... Yeah, I think there's going to be a little bit of time, though, because there's several prophecies that Israel has to fulfill, and I don't see them being inside of a seven-year period, uh, two or three of them anyway. And uh, so I think there's a little bit of time left, but uh, scrolls that talk about the dragon nations of Arabia and scrolls that talk about Rome and, you know, this, and you pull them all together. And that's what I'm saying about the whole idea that they thought it might be suspect because the main text came out of the Vatican archives. Well, if it was and it was doctored up, they did a horrible job because they incriminated themselves, you know. So yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing like with the early church fathers. People think, well, it might be Roman catholic -y. It's like mm, they're pretty much anti-Roman Catholic in theology. So, yeah. And it's just amazing how all these things collaborate. One, one thing I, I, I should have asked you, really, because I think it's a really important, at least uh, to get your opinion on, but I... I there's this uh, thing I've been hearing uh, that I think makes a lot of sense. Why do you think uh, some of the, uh, you know, you had the destruction of Jerusalem uh, and, and some other things, uh, you know, why, outside of just like God just saying, I want these things set aside for the time like the Book of Enoch, why do you think uh, the, the Jewish, uh, you know, why, why do you think they, they didn't really keep up with it? Uh, I, I've heard it proposed that, well, it seemed, it started to jibe too much with this Christianity thing, so they kind of just left it alone. I'm like, you know, when I read it, uh, I, I don't know. You have any feelings on, on that? And even like a Gad, um, it, 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 now back then, maybe not, but after the advent of Christ, then... I could understand where they're like, uh, you know, maybe this is not really a good one to dig back up, so let's not, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I think there's probably different reasons for different books. Um, but uh, in the case of, like, Gad, for instance, it's very clearly Trinitarian. My friends over at the, um, at the University of Tel Aviv are thinking, you know, they're just coming at it from a Jewish perspective. So they're saying, obviously, it's... The Trinitarian thing is very obvious because they say they know God the Father better because it's or God better because it's Yahweh the image and the presence and so they're saying well it's obviously Christianity because it's Trinitarian but they're not thinking that there is it, it is a Roman Christianity that is replacement theology and and the the slam is not necessarily the theology but the fact that they go after Israel you know so that's Zionist Christians or Protestant Christians that love Israel, for instance. That's not us, you know. Exactly. And so it's it's you got to be really careful with this stuff. But the the legend basically says that, and I see this from a lot of scribes that I know. They think that the other books are supposed to be secret, only for people that are mature to look at, and that you know you can always get take things out of context. But I've always thought that if they're written and can be you know got after, that we should publish them and let people know. And we should teach. And that's the main thing. Yeah. But uh, the, the Jews in Cochin are, are a very closed society. They don't want anybody to know anything. But it's their, their, their holy scriptures, so they're not going to alter it. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. They're not going to alter it, but it very clearly is Trinitarian. You know, and in the text of Gad, the, the evil group, which is in Rome, is Trinitarian. But then you go to the sermons of David, and David clearly says that God is one, but God is one in the sense that our mothers and fathers are one. So he very clearly teaches a trinity, which makes sense. If you got to know God int intimately, how could you not know yeah. the Father, the image, and the presence? You know that you know there's there's more to it than that. And so it's it's really amazing to see that kind of a thing. So I think. Some people say that this is not supposed to be shared with just everybody, 
because they either believe that and or don't want people knowing what it says because it messes up our theology. You know, just, just like I remember um, a uh, Presbyterian group that's Calvinist, and uh, they were they, they don't believe that Israel has anything to do because that would mess up the Calvinism. So the question was, well, Israel's come back, prophecies are fulfilled, how can you deny it? And they finally just said, well, obviously it has to be a coincidence because God replaced Israel because that's what our doctrine teaches. And if we were to recognize Israel, we'd have to you know, throw away the Calvinism and we're not going to do that. And it's just like, no, you should look at what happened and alter your theology based on what happened. You know? yeah. But it's just interesting. It's like, we don't want to talk about that because we'll have to change stuff. So that's, I think that, well, there's a lot of that. Yeah, and I, you know, I guess that that makes really a perfect sense looking at it through the the Jewish uh, mindset or the rabbinical lens of looking at things. Uh, with my Christian way of thinking, my thing is, you know, we get this is God's word. We got to get this out there. People have to know, but it's actually kind of the reverse for them, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. This is a very precious thing, and I can understand too, looking at. Roman Catholicism and and stuff like that, or maybe some other things. Maybe not to just point the finger solely there, but I can see how they might say, "Well, they took what was ours and misappropriated it." Look, look, you know, yeah. Look what we went through, and they just took it from us, and and now they, there's this whole thing, you know. Well, let's not keep that up. You know, we've still got these things. Let's just hold on to them. These are ours. Mm -hmm. And and I could I could see that um, in being the the Jews. So maybe some of these things uh, are are missing to the world, but maybe not to maybe maybe not uh, completely as we think. Maybe there are uh, other things out there that uh, you know. Maybe somebody will. Well, you know, if the Lord dictates, I'm sure they will come forward. Uh, they will come forth, uh, and and He's using whatever means including these uh, to keep them safe uh, that's the way I view things if they are from him indeed mm -hmm. well Enoch was kept by the Ethiopic church and yeah. like 3rd Corinthians was kept by the Armenian church and so there's a few things like that that are important the Dead Sea Scroll that, just verified uh, let yeah. us know that yes this is a good translation but like the Gnostic stuff again is a good example of why a lot of Christians are, are skeptical of anything yeah. outside the 66. And they should be. You should always be very suspect of anything that comes out. Um, and, and if there is anything good that the Lord wants to reveal, you know, Satan's going to be in there having at least two or three fake things by the same name. You know, that's what he would do, obviously. Absolutely. Uh, I'm finding that out as I, as I uh, go a little bit further in my research uh, in, in every regard. Um, I just remember as a teenager, I got a little curious about some things called the, the Lost Books. And mm. it, it burned me pretty badly in the sense that uh, I, was, I was a very... <laughs> half the time, half my time was spent reading comic books. The other half of the time was spent reading the Bible because it was more exciting to me to think... Samson was a real hero. I mean, these mm. events actually happened. So I was a little strange for a teenager, I guess. But uh, yeah, that's cool. Though. I got a hold of uh, got a hold of the lost books and things like that, and I I, I knew I didn't know what Gnostic meant, but believe me, I I understood uh, what it was about because it's it just something in me. I'm reading it and I'm like, oh no, oh no, I threw it away. Even as a teenager, I'm like, absolutely not. Uh, it just, uh, I, don't, I can't explain, it's just a spiritual sense. Um, but even as a teenager, uh, I think if, if the Lord knows how to let people know, um, and, and, and surely yours is probably more of a, a, a logical, academic sort of way uh, of, of and, you, and you have to be, because you're, you're, you're uh, publishing these things, but... Uh, so I, I'm sure it has to be as, uh, as beyond scrutiny as it can be for you, and and I think mm. that's the way the Lord would have you do it. I think you're doing it the way you're supposed to. Well, I got saved when I was 12. Uh, we my parents started going to a Nazarene church, and I think let's see, we went to a Nazarene and a Southern Baptist and a Charismatic and a Assembly of God and you know a few things like that. Uh, basically, as I got older, I became a Baptist minister for a while, 
And uh, then I wound up, just because wanting to study in the scriptures and everything, I've been attending a Calvary chapel for 12 or 15 years or so. So I would consider myself a Calvary chapel, basically. Um, just basic Bible teaching all the time. So if you read the Bible and try to practice it, you'd probably fit in perfect. You know, It's just amazing how that kind of stuff happens. Of course, in the Calvaries now, they're having a little bit of a split and stuff like that, which... I guess happens to every denomination, but uh, that's kind of my background. Wow, so. that that's great to uh, to have uh, I don't know just uh, had things together from an early age. I thought I did, but <laughs> you know, um, then too, uh, it was maybe five years ago. I've always researched. Well, the past twenty years or so, since being born again, I really started researching the Nephilim. It was just not something I thought of doing it just that one little bit in Genesis about the uh, you know the sons of God it's kind of like when you walk down a hallway in the dark and uh, you know like something snags your your shirt every time you walk past mm -hmm. this certain part I'm like what what is that not ignore it and every time I go past Genesis and I read I'm like what what so one day I decided I got to really look into this and you know um, I'm like so I'm like, okay, if all this, I start researching it, and, and I'm like, wow, there should be historical proof of these giants mm -hmm. and all this stuff. I find it with the, uh, I never had internet before, maybe 10 years ago or so, and then I started looking into it like, oh, all that. But then that settled down a little bit uh, while I'm trying to just live a regular life work and all this stuff. But then it uh, just dawned on me out of the blue one day, one day in prayer, literally, it just dawned on me the, the idea that well where are they today if they that's still an open question that's not are they around or not and then all of a sudden the image of a modern alien popped into my mind and I'm like mm. no wait no wait that's nuts and I'm thinking okay if this this is of the Lord I will look into and there will be other people who can who've looked into this who are reputable online this is where I go online looking for this and it, like I'm saying it's only like the past five years that uh I came into that and it was such a shock to me hmm. where I'm bringing this back to is that I I had to go back to those pastors I've been to a lot of different churches since I left the Methodist circle and I've uh, been under a rabbi I've been uh, I've been to a Nazarene church I spent a few years my daughter I raised her in one partially uh, for a good while just all types of wherever the Lord is welcome I feel at home uh, hmm. so I'm good with that um, but then I, I had to go back to some of these guys, these pastors whom I would consider friends. And, you know, I would uh, want to approach some of these topics. And do you know, not a single one has yet to this very day get back to me. No one, I mean, mm -hmm. silence. Um, so, you know, my, my only question is, is uh, you know, uh, have you looked at these things? Um, you know, uh, how does it relate to us today, or, or anything, you know, why have they not been discussed, um, and as far as the topic of UFOs, people are saying this stuff is happening, do you have any explanation mm -hmm. biblically for the, that's the sort of question that I, and I still, uh, after all these years, have not had a chance to go back and uh, ask, and I really feel like I belong in a congregation, and I don't ever want to uh, cut myself off from fellowship, but I've oh, still... Yeah. Still not found. Is it too much to expect a, a church somewhere where nothing is taboo to, if it's scripturally, to explore things like this to where, you know, you're not uh, chased out of the church because you want to talk about it or at the very I least? Think I think that's probably pretty hard. Um, in, in a lot of like the Calvary chapels, for instance, uh, anything scriptural, you know, goes. Uh, it seems like the Pastor Chuck, who founded it, I remember he originally said, well, it sounds like angels. You know, and somewhere along the line, they kind of changed their, their opinion. Uh, some do and some don't. Uh, but you're still able to find one who, who would say, well, who knows? And somebody else would say, no, we don't want to talk about that. And some so, are obviously going to go with the Sons of Seth thing. Yeah, still. yeah. Which, which is grammatically not possible. And people don't realize yeah. that. It, it says that the sons of God took the daughters of men. It doesn't say that the uh, sons of men took the daughters of God. Right. You know? 
So if you're looking at it that way, you're not going to say that the godly line of Seth all of a sudden became warlike and conquered all of the warriors on Cain's side and became evil. That's not what it says, you know. So it has to be God, sons of God that are evil sons of God. And the only way that works is angels, you know. Uh, plus all the other stuff. But Yeah, why, why yeah, even I, bring, mention the, the class of God, uh, Elohim, and man? Uh, in, two, in these categories, why even bring that up if that were the case? Yeah, my pastor thinks that it's probably Sethites and Canaanites. Yeah, and uh, and and of course he's asked me about it, and I'm like, well, I follow what the church father said, you know, and he believes everything the church father said because I've talked to him about the prophecies and salvation and everything like that. But that's the one issue that he says, I don't know, yeah. but it's so obvious everybody believed in Nephilim theology, not Sethites and yeah. Canaanites. The very first time you ever hear anybody mentioning Sethites and Canaanites, it comes from a Gnostic document, so a cult. Yeah. So it's really interesting to see that. But And uh, of course he knows I believe that, but I, that's in the Book of Enoch, for instance, I show the, the four different views on that and how, what, you know, how it has to work out grammatically. But uh, yeah, you're always going to have stuff like that somebody may or may not believe that and that's why I've always tried to when people look at me weird you know I've always tried to say I'm just saying there's a scroll that says that <laughs> you know? so that's there's scrolls that talk about the canopy so you want yeah. to say that's not possible okay it's not possible but there's a scroll that mentions it you know, you it, know? Uh, I, I, I heard about the, the hydroplane theory now this is purely scientific but when I looked at the hydroplane uh, theory that really made sense as far as uh, even from the very beginning in scripture where it says uh, that uh, the, it mentioned the, the waters above and uh, below and the, that the earth uh, uh, the, the firmament you know just how things were divided and when it said it talked about the, the, the waters of the deep uh, breaking forth you know you think about it uh, if it exploded from this uh, I, I saw a demonstration of it once, and it really something made sense in in uh, as far as kinetics and, and and that sort of thing. Where this, if it were a powerful enough, uh, you know, on a like a nuclear bomb sort of level, that this uh, these geysers would rip up and just explode upward. That in itself could damage the canopy, causing it to collapse. So the exploding the exploding waters from the the deep would have could have gone up and been the actual thing that caused the rest to come down um hmm. and that part i didn't see really illustrated in the uh the lectures that i i don't know if that part of the the one causing the other is in place uh as far as the teaching of that but it, it just the, the the dots connected on that and further much also, too, um, I've heard other people come along and say, you know, and these meteors that we see, see are that are mainly water that seem to come into our orbit could be the remains of some of that. Some of the, the, the water debris that was thrown into space could have frozen, and it, it comes around to us every now and then. Um, that's, that's why, and you notice, uh, when these comets come around, uh, you notice we, we just sent out a mission to one. What, what's so important about a comet that we need to, you know, uh, and I think it's a, a joint effort between uh, us and uh, I, I think maybe Russia. I'm not sure. Hmm. But uh, that's, that's something, you know, um, I'm sorry. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on, like flat earth and stuff like that. I'm not a part of that. And it doesn't, hmm, it, me it, it takes away from so much uh, other wonderful stuff that really does um, go with the Bible, and it's just uh, amazing. Uh, the good stuff, like the the work of uh, Dr. Uh, Ball, Dr. Carl Ball, and others. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Uh, he's been around for mm -hmm. years, but yeah, uh, amazing stuff. So actually, it was his early early picture of uh, you know um, just uh, the the canopy. Uh, Things that he said, um, as far as it filtering out harmful things, and even to the point where uh, they believed that uh, it would have generated that the sunlight and things like that uh, going through this crystalline sort of thing would have produced sort of a 
I know this sounds weird, but he said it so well. It's just sort of a, a sound almost when when the sun would rise. Basically, there would be music. They theorize like music that sweeps across oh, the land cool. at sunrise, that it would wake people up. This beautiful music, but it, it was a natural sound that occurred because of dynamics between you know what I'm saying the the canopy and mm -hmm. the sunlight, and it would literally sweep the land as the sun would rise and uh, I'm like wow um, yeah that could very easily be true so uh, it's it's a real pleasure by the way I uh, like I said uh, some of some of the materials that I have that are not uh, Kenneth Johnson I'm sorry is it Kenneth or Ken I've, I've never heard you uh, is your is your actual first name Kenneth or is it just Ken. Oh, it's actually Kenneth, but I go by Ken a lot. Okay. Uh, just, uh, you know, some of the books I have aren't aren't true Ken Johnson translations or, or books, so I'm actually wanting in the future. So I'm still in the process of going through your material. So, man, it, it's really good. Uh, good to have you here, and, and it's always something new. I pray, I'm sure I'm not alone in, in praying that the, the Lord will continue to bless your work. Uh, it's And I consider it a, a very powerful ministry. Um, it's, it's a witness to the Lord um, and all that he's doing and furthermore it's educational and it's a wake up call um, so I, I pray that the Lord continue to bless you and, and uh, it's, it's a real honor to, to have you with us today well it's an um, honor to be on the program thank you and uh, thank you for joining us uh, once again on the Sharpening Report I'm James DeWitt bye bye